What's going on kids? This is indeed a compilation of all of my previous Donkey Kong content. So if you haven't seen this before, I'm sure you're going to leave this knowing something to impress your friends regarding Donkey Kong, if they care. I did update a few facts, so you may see a couple of changes here and there, but aside from that, sit back and enjoy, and I'll see you at the end. Hey, what about you, Dixie? Little Dixie Doodle, you are fine. Is this Donkey Kong a different character from this Donkey Kong? The answer is yes. Is Cranky Kong from Donkey Kong Country the same Kong that kidnaps Pauline and goes up against Mario? The answer is also yes. Is Donkey Kong Jr. the father of this Donkey Kong? Or is this Donkey Kong the grown-up version of Donkey Kong Jr.? Here's the short answer. Nintendo cannot make up their minds. While Donkey Kong has been called the grandson of Cranky Kong a few times over the years, as of 2023 before the release of the Mario movie, Nintendo has identified Donkey Kong as the son and successor of Cranky Kong. I'll break this down further in the video. But for those of you that have no clue what I'm talking about, don't worry. I'll start from the beginning and discuss how this lovable gorilla potentially saved Nintendo from a complete financial downfall. Welcome to Origin Oracle, everyone, the series where I take your favorite video game characters and break down their origins, both in-game and IRL. This is the first video for the Donkey Kong franchise, and of course, we'll start with Donkey Kong, the classic one. So go grab some snacks, kick back, and let's head back in time. Okay. Now you die. So most of us know this story, but let's go over it once again so we cover all our bases. Donkey Kong first appeared in Nintendo's smash hit arcade game, Donkey Kong, released in July of 1981. And side note, if your local arcade or barcade is missing this game, it's not a real arcade. You all should see my disappointment when I can't find the Donkey Kong machine in these false establishments. Anyway, the game begins with Donkey Kong kidnapping the girlfriend of the game's carpenter protagonist, Jumpman. And no, this is not Mario's father, but I'll also debunk this theory later. So while Nintendo would later change Jumpman's name to Mario, initially he was unnamed, and the girlfriend was simply referred to as Lady. Her name would also get a change, becoming Pauline, named after Polly James, wife of Nintendo's warehouse manager at the time, Don James. And it's good to see Nintendo acknowledging her a bit more these days. So we see Donkey Kong ascend the construction site with Pauline in tow, accompanied by a variation of the musical theme from the hit radio slash TV show Dragnet. He drops Pauline on a platform before stomping on top of the construction site, altering the landscape of the level before he settles at the top left side of the screen with a smug laugh. So this may not seem like a big deal now, but this quick series of events masterfully sets the stage, giving the player everything they need to know about the objective before they start playing. Cutscenes like this weren't prominent in arcade games at the time, and while Pac-Man also had brief intermissions depicting silly events, Donkey Kong is one of the first to use them to move this simple plot forward. So intending to save Pauline, the player now takes control of Jumpman to ascend the construction site as DK does everything to stop him from reaching them. If Jumpman successfully reaches the top, he and Pauline share a brief moment of relief before Donkey Kong grabs her again and continues to climb. There are four unique stages within the game, and the further you progress, the more it demands your quarters, with Donkey Kong increasing the speed in which he throws barrels and the faster these annoying fireballs spawn. It's actually crazy to me how long sentient fireballs have been a staple within both the Mario and DK franchises. We just don't give these little guys enough credit. Anyway, let's take a second to look at how Donkey Kong came to be both an established Nintendo character and a successful arcade title. If you've been watching my Mario videos up to this point, this is going to be like an Avengers style crossover with familiar names. We have to turn the clock back to the year 1889. This man is Fusajiro Yamauchi, the founder of Yamauchi Nintendo, a Japanese card company based in Kyoto. Who the hell? Cash. Okay, I'll admit we didn't have to go back this far, so let's fast forward to the late 1970s. Fusajiro's great-grandson, Hiroshi Yamauchi, is now the president of Nintendo. And as they begin to shift away from the playing cards and the toy market, they begin to turn their attention to arcade games. Nintendo would do this in response to two major events. The first being an oil crisis back in 1973 that heavily affected the costs of manufacturing toys. Just for perspective though, if you made it through that awkward 2008 phase, you got through the worst oil prices in history. So here's a cookie. The other major event that pushed Nintendo into the arcade market was the success of Taito's Space Invaders in 1978 which in four years had grossed $3.8 billion. This made the game not only the highest grossing video game of all time, but the highest grossing entertainment product at that time. So it's no shock Nintendo decided to throw their hat in the ring, starting with a few electromechanical arcade gun games like Wild Gunman. So in the summer of 1977, 
Nintendo would also try their hand in the home console market, collaborating with Mitsubishi to release their very first video game console, the Color TV game. Even with Atari being the more popular company at the time, this series of consoles was a hit, selling 3 million units mainly due to its intentionally lower price point in comparison to other consoles on the market. But let's turn our attention back to the arcade side of things. I promise you'll see DK again soon. After a couple of failures in the arcade market with games like Sheriff and Space Fever, Nintendo was focused on developing a game called Radar Scope, a pretty simple arcade shoot 'em up. And this would also be one of Shigeru Miyamoto's very first projects for Nintendo, assisting with their art production. The game was released in October of 1980, and Nintendo decided to go all in, testing it with arcade audiences in Seattle. And after it was received positively by some American audiences, they sank their budget into developing cabinets. I mean a lot of them. Meanwhile, Yamauchi's son-in-law, Minoru Arakawa, would establish Nintendo of America in New York City to take on the Western market. But those 3,000 radar scope cabinets took four months to get all the way to New York, and by then, USA. the interest was already gone, with Nintendo only managing to move 1,000 of their 3,000 arcade cabinets. Arakawa moved Nintendo of America headquarters over to Seattle to cut down on the shipping time from Japan, but Nintendo as a whole was facing a dire financial crisis. But Arakawa had a great idea that he suggested to his father-in-law. Gather the best resources at Nintendo's disposal and create a killer game to retrofit onto the thousands of radar scope cabinets sitting in their warehouse. This was the birth of Donkey Kong. Once I was the ape of the So we head back to Japan, Japan, where this new arcade title was being produced by Gunpei Yokoi, the man who played a large role in the creation of the Game & Watch, Game Boy, Game Boy Pocket, the Virtual Boy, Metroid, Fire Emblem, the list goes on. But joining Yokoi was Shigeru Miyamoto stepping up to direct his very first game, alongside contracted developers from Ikegami Tsuchinki, who mostly focused on programming. Originally, Nintendo was attempting to pursue a license to make a video game based on Popeye, but their attempts failed due to technical limitations. Despite that, they used the characters of Popeye as a jump off point, inspiring Miyamoto to create new characters based on Popeye, Bluto, and Olive Oil. And looking at this art from Donkey Kong, I'm sure you can see the resemblances. Bluto's brutish build would transfer over to Donkey Kong, who served as the game's villain and was intended to be a pet of the main character. Though it's not included in later descriptions of this story, Miyamoto has stated in interviews that Donkey Kong was Mario's pet gorilla at one point. Inspirations for the Donkey Kong character would also be pulled from Beauty and the Beast and of course, King Kong himself, which would earn Nintendo a nice lawsuit from Universal, but we'll get into that in a second. The gameplay itself originally had Mario navigating a maze without an iconic jumping mechanic. In fact, at that time, there was only one other game that could be described as a platformer, and that was Space Panic, developed by Universal. Not that one. The platformer genre as a whole wasn't even a thing yet, especially jumping. But the Donkey Kong team asked themselves, if you had a barrel rolling towards you, what would you do? Luckily, the radar scope cabinets had an extra button on them aside from the joysticks. So boom, Mario can now jump and the rest is history. But where did they get the name Donkey Kong? For some reason, this is heavily debated, but I'll start with Miyamoto's answer to this question in a February 2000 interview with Nintendo Online Magazine. I had always been under the impression that Kong meant gorilla, so I wanted to name him something something Kong. And so, because I wanted to make a dumb character, I went and looked that word up in a dictionary. When I did that, I found the word donkey had the meaning in addition to that of the animal. Strangely enough, when Universal took Nintendo to court over the name Donkey Kong and the concept being too similar to King Kong in 1983, more details regarding the creation of the name came up in their depositions. The depositions reveal that Nintendo's export manager Shinichi Todori was originally contacted by Gunpei Yokoi and asked him to come up with the potential names for the character, since he was normally consulted for game titles in the past before they exported them to the West. Todori would come up with a few names for the game, submitting 10 of them to Yokoi, Donkey Kong being one of them. And to take this a step further, Todori would state the following in his deposition. I didn't think of a good word in English, therefore I tried to search for an English word for the Japanese terminology, tonma which roughly translates to dope or oaf. 
So by attempting to find a good English word for tonma, he stumbled upon donkey. Shout out to Gaming Historian for going all the way to the National Archives to dig up this information, by the way. You can check out his video on how Nintendo came up with some of their character names if you want more details. But based on the depositions of Todori, Yokoi, and Miyamoto, it's pretty clear that Miyamoto had no hand in the final name Donkey Kong. So do you guys think he's intentionally taking credit for this? I can't seem to find where this Mr. Todori has gone, or even if he's alive, but regardless, he hasn't spoken on the matter since the lawsuit, it seems. Gunpei Okoye died in a tragic roadside accident, so we won't be getting any objections from him either. I'm not saying Miyamoto planned this, but... All jokes aside, Donkey Kong was released to huge success in the Western markets, becoming the next bestseller and gave a foothold for Nintendo in the United States. Also, I gotta give props to Arakawa, his wife Yoko, and the tiny Nintendo of America team at the time who gutted all the radar scope machines themselves to apply the Donkey Kong kits to these cabinets manually. That was something I learned researching this and I can't imagine the amount of work it took to do that to 2,000 of these machines. Oh, and by the way, Nintendo did eventually get to make that Popeye game. Popeye video game has the boys fighting worse than ever. Oh, Popeye! I just thought it was neat that they still committed to it. As for the lawsuit from Universal, that came after the game's release. Funny enough, here's a Nintendo-themed amusement park at Universal Studios Hollywood. So let that be a lesson on forgiveness to everyone. Nintendo of America's attorney, Howard Lincoln, hired a highly experienced attorney at the time, John Kirby, to take the case. Long story short though, Kirby argued that not only was Donkey Kong different enough from King Kong for Nintendo to hold the rights, but also argued that King Kong was in the public domain, referencing a lawsuit that Universal Studios themselves handled in 1975, proving that King Kong was in fact public domain. So after their victory, Universal paid back all of Nintendo's legal fees and Nintendo awarded their star attorney with a sailboat aptly named Donkey Kong. And if that wasn't enough, they would go on to name Kirby after him as well. With the success of Donkey Kong, Nintendo would of course make a follow-up. I got Donkey Kong, and now I'll get you too, Junior. I'm Donkey Kong Junior, and that's my papa. I'm trying to save him, and boy do I need your help. All the ideas that they couldn't implement into Donkey Kong were now thrown into Donkey Kong Junior, again directed by Miyamoto. And it's here we're introduced to Donkey Kong's son, Junior. Aww. The plot is a bit of a twist this time, with Mario as the aggressor, attempting to get his revenge, placing Donkey Kong in a cage. So Junior has to climb vines, brave obstacles, and collect keys to ultimately free his father in the final showdown with Mario in the city. To win, Junior has to put all six keys into keyholes to free Donkey Kong from his cage and make the surrounding platforms disappear, brutally murdering Mario in the process. That's only the NES version, but in the arcade version, DK kicks the shit out of Mario. Originally, Miyamoto wanted Donkey Kong himself to be playable, but his size presented some complications with maneuverability. So why not just make a smaller Donkey Kong the star? While this game wasn't as popular as the original Donkey Kong, it got enough attention that Nintendo would develop a third game in the Donkey Kong series. And that brings us to Donkey Kong 3. Released in October of 1983, Donkey Kong 3 brought a new protagonist to the forefront, Stanley. Who? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Mario is still being treated for brain damage at this part of the timeline. Donkey Kong continues to harass people by breaking into Stanley's greenhouse and upsetting the bugs, which puts Stanley's flowers at risk. So Stanley has to head out with his sprayer to kill bees and chase Donkey Kong away. Wow, Stanley, killing bees is not good for your plants, but I do see the issue with a giant gorilla hanging out in the rafters of your greenhouse. This technically wasn't Stanley's first appearance, though, as he had his own Game & Watch game called Greenhouse. Stanley's going buggy. Mario Brothers have their hands full, and Donkey Kong's going ape. Or yes, he's stopping bugs from ruining oh his plants. God. Donkey Kong 3 ended up selling significantly less than its predecessors and would be the last Donkey Kong arcade game on the market. Though it did get a Japanese exclusive semi-sequel known as Donkey Kong 3 Daigyakushu for some of the 8-bit home computers produced by NEC in the 80s. Developed by Hudson Soft, who would go on to make Bomberman and develop some of the Mario Party games, this follow-up to Donkey Kong 3 once again stars Stanley, and is more of a straight-up shooter in this case. I don't know about you guys, but it looks like Stanley left the greenhouse and is out for blood this time around. The manual states that this game takes place some time after Donkey Kong 3, but it just kind of leaves it at that. The writers even encourage players to send in their stories for the game to Hudson, so basically, anything you come up with the story for this game is canon to the Donkey Kong series. So I asked ChatGPT to write one for me. Donkey Kong has returned to wreak havoc on the jungle once again, but this time he's brought along some new friends. 
The jungle's inhabitants are in a panic as Donkey Kong and his allies begin to destroy everything in sight. In the midst of the chaos, a young man named Stanley decides to take action. Armed only with his trusty bug spray, he sets out to put a stop to Donkey Kong's rampage. So there you go. That's officially part of the Mario slash DK timeline. So even though Donkey Kong 3 was the last arcade game for DK, there was a line of Game & Watch titles that would unite him with Mario. Many of these are rehashes of the arcade titles like Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Donkey Kong 3, but there's a couple of interesting ones to note, like 1984's Donkey Kong Circus, which features Mario as the animal trainer, I'm assuming, while DK has to balance on a barrel and juggle pineapples. The other game was Donkey Kong Hockey, also released in 1984, which is a two-player game where Mario faces off with Donkey Kong in a game of hockey. It's pretty self-explanatory, but can we call this the very first Mario sports game in existence? What do you guys think? But as you all can see, Donkey Kong exploded in popularity, resulting in him getting his own cereal. Yeah, this was sweetened corn cereal shaped like barrels, and some of these boxes had promotions within them called Donkey Kong Instant Winner Game, which gave lucky cereal consumers the chance to win prizes like a Donkey Kong Game & Watch, Donkey Kong shoelaces, and a whole ass Donkey Kong arcade cabinet? I almost went on a googling spree to find out who won, but this video is long enough as it is, so leave a comment if you were the winner of that cabinet. No verification required, if I you won. won, you won. So in addition to his own serial, Donkey Kong would also become the main feature in the 1984 animated show, Saturday Supercade. This show would be a collection of animated segments celebrating popular video game series at the time like Donkey Kong, Frogger, Qbert, and Pitfall. The Donkey Kong segments starred Mario as a circus owner who, alongside Pauline, the animal trainer, would chase after Donkey Kong once he escapes from the circus. That's the setup, but each episode puts the main trio in different scenarios involving other minor supporting characters and villains. They even include our boy Stanley in one of the episodes. Mario is voiced by Peter Cullen, known famously for his role as Optimus Prime. But from the episodes that I can find, it looks like Mario never managed to catch a Donkey Kong. Saturday Supercade also featured a Donkey Kong Jr. segment, with Jr. leaving the jungle to search for his father at Mario's circus. By the time he arrives, DK has already escaped, but a young man named Bones befriends Jr. and takes him on an adventure to find his father. The Donkey Kong Jr. segments depict their adventures together, and sadly, I don't think Jr. ever reunites with his father in this show. By the way, DK Jr. here is voiced by Frank Welker, who has way too many popular roles to count, but you may know him as Scooby-Doo and Fred Jones, Megatron. But just to put a nice pretty bow on all of this, the Goombas and Yoshi from the 1993 Super Mario Bros. film. So a couple years after this, the Mario Brothers became the newest craze. Donkey Kong was in a little bit of a hiatus, but despite all that, if you're looking for the definitive classic Donkey Kong game, look no further than the 1994 Game Boy version, also known as Donkey Kong. This was developed by Pax Sofnica, a dev team that worked exclusively with Nintendo at the time, but Miyamoto was heavily involved as well. While this may start off looking like the original arcade game with the little facelift, this game is its own beast. The game begins with Donkey Kong once again kidnapping Pauline. And just like the arcade titles, he starts throwing barrels at the top of this construction site. You play the first four levels, defeat Donkey Kong, and Pauline is saved, right? Well, no, this game opens up into a 97 level expansion with Mario chasing down DK through the city, the forest, a ship, the jungle, the desert, an airplane. Donkey Kong is not having it this time around. Even Donkey Kong Jr. hops in to try and deter Mario from defeating his papa. And throughout, there's a new gameplay style introduced with Mario having to track down keys in each level to open doors to proceed. And remember Pauline's items in the original arcade game that she drops that helps increase your score? They're here in this game too. But picking these up unlocks a bonus minigame of Wheel of Fortune that earns Mario some additional lives. I also need to mention that the Super Game Boy attachment for the SNES gave this game colored graphics and audio enhancements as well. And Mario doesn't just jump in this game. This would be the first title that introduced his backflip mechanic that we have now as a staple in all Mario titles. And as for DK, we would see his iconic red necktie for the very first time, which would influence his design in the later Donkey Kong Country series. This was the last major DK title produced by Miyamoto before Nintendo started to hand the franchise off to other studios to work on. But man, what a way to go out. Okay, so what happened to Donkey Kong and Jr.? 
In the fall of 1994, the legendary Rareware would take over the development of major games for the franchise, releasing the wildly successful Donkey Kong Country. But I wanted to introduce Donkey Kong Country to address one of the questions I presented at the beginning of the video. Donkey Kong Country introduces a new version of DK, a younger hip gorilla that's moving on from the old days of kidnapping damsels and taking on the mantle of Donkey Kong. In this game, we see an older gorilla named Cranky Kong that is stuck reminiscing about his old days as an arcade era icon. We find out that Cranky here is the original Donkey Kong, and the new Donkey Kong that serves as our protagonist is referred to as his grandson. It's referenced in the instructions manual, so this should be DK Jr's son then, right? Where does the confusion come in? Well, later on with the release of Donkey Kong 64, the instructions manual refers to Donkey Kong as Cranky Kong's son. Hang on, let me muddy the waters even further here. So back in 1999, Rare published questions from fans on their website, answered by Lay Loveday, the writer in charge of the manuals and scripts for Donkey Kong Country. One fan submitted a question saying, I'm a bit confused on some of the issues surrounding dynastic succession in the Donkey Kong games. If Cranky Kong was the original Donkey Kong, and the current Donkey Kong is his son, is the current DK the same infant gorilla who starred in Donkey Kong Jr.? I have also seen references to DK being Cranky's grandson. In that case, what became of the heroic Donkey Kong Jr.? Did he vanish mysteriously in order to provide a plot cliché for one of his son's future adventures? Roderick Arbuthnot, specialist in simian drama, Ape Research Society of England. Arse. This guy was way ahead of his time. But I find Rare's answer to be even more interesting. As far as I know, RDK is the son of Cranky, which does indeed make him the original DK Jr. all grown up. So if you see Cranky referred to as DK's granddad anywhere, just cover your eyes and hum loudly until it goes away. And Nintendo of Europe would also back this claim on their website for the Game Boy Advance port of Donkey Kong Country. Okay, so he's Cranky's son now, fine. What? A tweet from Greg Mails, one of the designer from Donkey Kong Country in 2017. I'm pretty sure when I made this stuff up nearly 25 years ago that he was his grandson. By DK64, he was so senile he couldn't remember. Huh. Okay, so Cranky is too old and senile to remember if DK is his son or grandson. That's pretty sad. I guess this is true. His profile also says in Smash Brothers Brawl and Ultimate that he's his grandson. The Donkey Kong who fought that epic battle with Mario was this guy's grandfather. That was a long time ago. See, Donkey Kong Country Returns also says that Cranky is the grandfather. Okay, so I think we've come to a conclusion here. Cranky Kong is DK's grandfather for sure. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? There's also the fan theory that Jumpman from the classic Donkey Kong games is Mario's father, but there's no basis for that, and Nintendo has never hinted at this idea because he's clearly addressed as Mario in both Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. So I'm not gonna agree to that theory unless we get a Jumpman lore dump in the Mario movie or some future game. But why is Cranky old now and Mario isn't? So people have gone as far as using the lifespan of gorillas to debunk the Jumpman theory and even attribute Mario's frequent job changes at that time to the actions of a young man that hasn't figured out his career path yet. And to add even more salt on this identity crisis wound, Yoshi's Island DS introduces the baby versions of several Mario characters as Bowser attempts to kidnap the seven star children. DK is one of these kids. Now whether or not this is Cranky Kong or Donkey Kong is heavily debated. If this is Donkey Kong, that means he and Mario are the same age. And if Donkey Kong Jr. is still a baby when Mario puts Cranky in a cage, that means... Hmm, wait a minute. What if Donkey Kong Jr. has an older brother or sister? I don't know if any other videos address this, but let me cook. I'm not even gonna look it up. So there's no official age for Mario, but Nintendo has hinted that he is in his mid-20s. So let's go with a solid 26. Now I know he looks crusty and hairy in his early art, but the earliest age one can become a carpenter is 17, assuming this is New York. Gorillas are considered elderly at 40, but the oldest male gorilla on earth, Ozzy, survived to age 61. So let's play with this number and say present day Cranky Kong is 48 years old. So if we go with that, it could make Cranky roughly 22 years older than Mario. So if Mario is a 17 year old in the original Donkey Kong, that puts Cranky Kong at age 39. He's getting up there, but he's still a massive gorilla. Following me so far? No. 
So if we assume that Junior is born around that time, we'd only have a 9 year time span to account for Junior not only reaching a fertile age, but also our DK growing up to being a full size gorilla by the time Mario is 26 years old. So consider this, male gorillas are able to reproduce at 11 to 13 years of age, so if DK and Mario are born around the same time, Cranky Kong could have potentially had another child that conceived DK 17 years prior. That puts Cranky at 22 years old when Mario and DK are born, and the parent of DK would have to be at least, depending on the sex, between 8 to 13 years of age, which is more than possible at Cranky's current age. So DK Jr. is the uncle of Donkey Kong, which means that this DK in Yoshi's Island could totally be the current DK I just saved the freaking world. I know this is going to rile up the comment section, so take all of that with a grain of salt because Nintendo just doesn't give a fuck. I'd shower you with coconut cream pies. This rebranded version of Donkey Kong debuted in the highly successful Super Nintendo title, Donkey Kong Country, released worldwide in November 1994. Nintendo handed off the development of the series to the legendary studio Rare Limited. But before we get to them, let's talk about the in-game introduction to Donkey Kong first. Aside from that timeless intro, the game throws you right in with the first level being jungle hijinks. The player can just run off into the jungle at that point and start the game. Or you can backtrack a little bit to a cave at the beginning of the level that turns out to be the banana stash of the Kongs. It's been completely cleared out, which makes the Kongs visibly upset, and we'll see many future titles with bananas serving as DK's damsel in distress, which is also joked about in the manual by the way. Speaking of which, the intro to Donkey Kong Country may be simple with the plot details, but the instructions manual is a whole different beast. I was surprised to see four full pages of text for the story alone in this manual, but I was equally excited because, you know, Content. So within these pages, we learn that our story takes place on Donkey Kong Island, home to Donkey Kong alongside his family and friends. Our hero lives in a treehouse right above the largest stash of bananas in the jungle, and arguably the world. Right before retiring for the night, he asks Diddy, a small spider monkey, to serve as the night watch for the horde of bananas. So quick side note, as a kid, when I played Donkey Kong Country, I always had this assumption that DK and Diddy were the best of friends. But reading this manual, I feel like I'm a little mistaken. Cause check this out. Okay, little buddy, Donkey had said in his patronizing voice. As part of your hero training, you gotta stand guard tonight over my bananas. I'll relive you at midnight, buddy. Yeah, right. Now he was alone. So Donkey Kong might be somewhat of a f boy. And as you guys probably guessed, Diddy gets jumped in the middle of the night by a reptilian race known as the Kremlings. And not only do they stuff poor Diddy inside a barrel, but they also clean out Donkey Kong's entire banana stash. DK is woken up in the morning by a frantic Cranky Kong, who ends up laughing at his misfortune as they discover the bananas and Diddy are missing. Diddy's obsession with being like me has gone too far. He may be a long way from being a true video game hero, but he had the guts, the reflexes, the heart. You know, I can't help but wonder if this characterization was meant to be a response to Sonic. Sonic and Knuckles released only a few weeks before this game, and the industry figures at the time were calling the two games a battle between lock-on technology and 3D rendered graphics. So I may be onto something with this. I'll talk about why these graphics were groundbreaking for the industry at the time, but let's finish up with the manual here first. So Donkey Kong's adventure to save his bananas, and Diddy, begins, and this story gives much more context to Diddy struggling to escape this barrel at the start of the first level. Cranky is also sure to remind us that we're only reading this story because we're bored. So shout out to everyone that used to read these on the toilet. This was definitely much more fun than the chemicals in your shampoo. By the way, the Game Boy re-release for Donkey Kong Country actually has full cutscenes for all the events I just explained. I figured I'd mention this because I just found this out, and it could have saved me some time on editing, but let's move on. Now I gave the short version of the story here, but I also found out the original story was 15 whole pages until Nintendo voted to condense it down. So as you can see, this was a different kind of Donkey Kong that didn't take itself very seriously. Rare injected a lot of fourth wall breaking humor and meta jokes into the series, like references to Cranky Kong's arcade days, DK being referred to as a video game hero, or the fact that this game doesn't have a princess that needs to be saved. But the gameplay itself managed to keep things simple, with these fancy 3D rendered graphics Donkey Kong was now starring in a full platformer. I just found it poetic that the original Donkey Kong arcade game is credited as one of the very first platforming games, and here we have Donkey Kong Country owning the genre once again. So as Donkey Kong heads out into the jungle to recover his bananas, you find the trap Diddy Kong pretty quickly. I gotta take a second to say that this right here is great game design, because not only is the barrel violently shaking, 
you hear distressed monkey noises coming from within it. If you are completely unfamiliar with this game, at this point in time you already know that this barrel can be interacted with from both the audio and visual cues. So at this stage the player is probably asking themselves how they can break it open. You can try jumping on it, but that won't work, so maybe there's another button to... Aha! DK can lift barrels and throw them. So congratulations, you've now learned how to perform one of the most important mechanics in the game. And right after that, you're introduced to Diddy Kong, who will be your adventuring companion for the remainder of the game. You can even play as him, but let me not say too much because homie's getting his own video. But unlike Mario games up to this point, you don't just clear these stages, you attempt to fully complete them by collecting bananas, the letters of Kong littered throughout each stage, balloons for additional lives and animal tokens. And each level is dense with collectibles and hidden paths, which gives Donkey Kong Country a huge replayability factor. So while Donkey and Diddy go off on their adventure, let's discuss how this game came about. We gotta go even further back in time to the early 1980s in the United Kingdom. Queen Elizabeth II is still the queen, Michael Jackson released Billie Jean at some point, and these two brothers, Tim and Chris Stamper, are finding some success in game development. They're part of a development company known as Ultimate Play the Game, responsible for home computer titles like Jetpack and Saberwolf, and these games would offer Ultimate Play the Game some success. Before the release of the Famicom, which would eventually become the Nintendo Entertainment System in the West, Ultimate Play the Game was mostly developing games for the ZX Spectrum, which was the most popular microcomputer in Britain at that time. But the Spectrum didn't seem like a great avenue for growth in the market, and the employees at Ultimate Play the Game started to realize it would reach a dead end if they kept tailoring their software to it. Enter the Famicom. The company believed that it was a much better piece of hardware, and it would be the best choice for their games moving forward. The brothers would kindly ask Nintendo for the programming specs needed to create Nintendo games, to which Nintendo politely replied, Go fuck yourself. I had to subscribe to Bloomberg to confirm this information in one of their old ass 90s articles, so that must deserve a like or something. So after their rejection from Nintendo, the brothers would found Rare in 1985, and the focus would be to reverse engineer the Famicom console to learn what made it tick. This process took them 8 months, and once it was complete, they marched back to Nintendo in Kyoto to show off to Nintendo of America president Minoru Arakawa that not only did they reverse engineer the system, but they could make impressive technical demos for it as well. Arakawa was impressed and granted the Stamper Brothers a Nintendo developer license and an unlimited budget for games for the Famicom. So with their success, they moved their office to Twycross in England and established a US headquarters in Miami, Florida. And I never thought my hometown would be relevant in any of these videos. Rare would go on to develop over 60 NES titles, one of their most popular being Battletoads. And Battletoads gained them enough notoriety to even get a crossover with another hit beat em up series, Double Dragon. So by the time the Super Nintendo was on the horizon, Rare was already a well-known developer, if not the biggest developer from the UK. So instead of going all in on creating games for the Super Nintendo, they heavily invested their profits into the Challenge workstations instead. These were a family of supercomputers in the early 90s, created by Silicon Graphics, which Rare required for their development teams to research 3D modeling. And to put it in perspective, these were the same machines that would help to get Jurassic Park on the big screen in 1993. Rare even needed to order a massive air conditioning unit just to make sure the machines didn't overheat. By the way, it cost Rare £80,000 for each of these challenge workstations, so let's adjust that for inflation. You're looking at around £183,000 or £227,000 thousand US dollars today in 2023. Get me a computer that costs that much today and it could probably edit these videos for me. And then maybe I can get my life back. So with Nintendo and Sega at the peak of their console war in 1993, there was essentially a space race between the two companies to see who could pioneer the most groundbreaking game experience. You can't do this on Nintendo Genesis Dutch. 16-bit sports action. Luckily for Nintendo, Rare was experimenting with 3D graphics on a boxing game called Brute Force. And after a demonstration, Nintendo wanted a game that used that technology. Something to compete with the gorgeous Aladdin game on the Sega Genesis. And I'm with Nintendo on this one, that game slaps. Tim Stamper would go on to suggest the idea of creating a new platform game for the Super Nintendo that used pre-rendered 3D graphics, taking some inspiration from how they used digitized footage in Mortal Kombat. Nintendo would then officially grant Rare permission to revive the Donkey Kong franchise. And while it's somewhat debated whether Rare was given the choice on which character to use, Donkey Kong Country would still become one of the most successful game titles from the 90s. 
I want to know the secrets that the crystal holds and all the magic power that it brings. Finally, we're at the part of the story where Donkey Kong gets his redesign. Rare had a team of 12 working on their new title, led by Greg Mails. Nintendo gave Rare space to do their work for the most part, but Miyamoto did have some involvement during development, advising the team on how to improve the game and some of the designs. He even suggested the implementation of DK's hand slap move, which can be used to defeat enemies. Funny enough, one of Rare's early pitches actually had Wario as the villain. Yeah, the game would have opened up with Mario finishing designing some type of time machine and then Wario ambushes him with some gun that turns Mario to stone. And then some parrot that's living with Mario goes off to tell Donkey Kong and then that kind of just starts the adventure. But this idea was scrapped by Nintendo since they wanted to feature a brand new villain in Donkey Kong Country this time around. The man in charge of the redesign for Donkey Kong was Kevin Bayliss, who's pretty active on Twitter these days by the way. Some of the concept art you'll see in this video more than likely came from him, but Nintendo made sure to fax reference material his way to keep the redesign up to their standards, like the red tie introduced in Donkey Kong 94 being kept for his new model. Aside from that, Bayless wanted to make the new look feel believable and easy to animate, drawing inspiration from his previous work on Battletoads. And while he initially took a bulkier approach to the redesign, suggestions from Nintendo would lead Bayless to the end result we see across the series to this day. Diddy Kong would be introduced as a side character that would serve somewhat as an extra life for players, being able to take the hit for Donkey if he was damaged or vice versa. He would also provide the player with some much needed company on the adventure. So to gain inspiration, Rare ended up taking a trip to the zoo to gain an idea of what realistic gorilla movements might look like, but they determined that their movements would be a little too slow for their gameplay, and based DK's movements on the gallop of a horse instead. On the development side, the team went through sleepless nights, mapping out entire levels using post-it notes. Greg Mailed said, quote, The thing I really remember from that project was the immense struggle of reducing the massive SGI rendered images to a really small size. It was like a giant jigsaw puzzle. All the levels were designed on post-it notes and stuck together. We'd come up with ideas for a level, say swinging ropes, draw them all out on post-it notes, and stick them together in the order we wanted them to be used. That's how every single level was designed. The team would reportedly work 12 hours per day throughout the week to get this game done. So despite the development crunch here, the game would release to be an overwhelming success, setting the record for the fastest selling video game at that time. They would manage to move over 500,000 copies within a week, with some media outlets declaring it the best game of 1994. Sonic fan within me has to disagree. You good, bro? Like <laughs> anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's check in on DK and Diddy. So they managed to track down the leader of the Kremlings, King K. Rule. Get it? Cruel? And after taking him down, we're treated to, in my opinion, one of the greatest fakeouts in an old school game. K. Rule gets right back up after the credits roll, and the battle continues with a slight increase in difficulty. But ultimately, DK and Diddy are the victors. They manage to recover the bananas and return them to their horde, ending the very first Donkey Kong Country. This game would open the door to a sequel title starring Diddy Kong, who has to save a captive DK, and a third title starring members of the Extended Kong tribe that I'll discuss in other videos. I'm 2500 words in and I'm way behind schedule. But don't sleep on Donkey Kong Country's handheld counterpart, Donkey Kong Land, for the Game Boy. I assure you, it's its own thing, and the soundtrack equally amazing for an 8-bit title, also composed by the renowned David Wise. This game actually has its own story and it's raised as a sequel to Donkey Kong Country. It involves Cranky complaining to DK and Diddy that the reason everybody enjoyed Donkey Kong Country is because of all the fancy graphics. So so DK and Diddy make a bet with Cranky that their game would be just as successful on an 8-bit system like the Game Boy. They even decide to call up King K. Rule to come steal their bananas again to give them a reason for an adventure. That is literally the plot to this game. That should be reason enough for you guys to play this game, but if you're looking for something old school, go ahead and check this one out. But before I move on from the OG Donkey Kong Country games, we have to talk about the TV series. I've sprinkled clips of this throughout the video and the internet kind of loves to dunk on this one, but let's see who was behind this. The series follows the adventures of Donkey Kong who is declared the future ruler of Congo Bongo Island. Hmm, why do I always have to start the day with a tough decision? He's chosen by the magical artifact, the Crystal Coconut, which is connected to a spirit known as Inka Dinkadu, and all of this is established before the series even begins. King K. Rule is the main villain in this series as well, and is of course after that crystal coconut during the course of the series. 
This all started with a French animation studio named Media Lab, which managed to obtain rights from Nintendo for 13 episodes of a Donkey Kong Country animated series. Media Lab would approach Canada's largest animation studio, Nelvana, to assist with getting the show off the ground. This would actually be in response to Media Lab firing the original writers. One of the writers of the series, Erica Strobel, stated that the original scripts produced by the fired writers had racist and sexist jokes that were inappropriate for a kid's show within it. So Media Lab was using new technology to create a computer animated show with the help of motion capturing, or as the studio called it at the time, performance animation. This is one of the very first shows to use motion capture tech for animation, and while this kind of technology was cutting edge, it came with quite a few limitations. And due to this, animators had to limit the number of new locations that were featured in the show or new characters implemented into the series. Interestingly enough, this show debuted in France back in September 1996 and wouldn't officially air in the US until August of 98. They managed to produce 40 episodes which ran until the summer of 2000. So this show did air for quite some time. And while the animation may not hold up so well, some of the songs featured in this show are still bangers to this day. So if you're wondering why there are so many songs in this show, Erica was actually asked about this too, and her response was, why were the songs included? That wasn't Nelvana's idea. It was Media Lab. The French wanted song sequences. Why? I do not know. I thought it was bizarre. But to the songwriter's credit, they wrote some pretty funny lyrics. It was two guys, Pure West, that wrote all the songs in the opening theme for DK. They were pretty brilliant. As for Erica, she would continue to write for a number of shows, the most popular being Total Drama Island. But unfortunately, in March 2017, she would lose her long-running battle with depression. But on a positive note, it's safe to say many will look back on her works and remember a much simpler time in their lives. So as we progress into the late 90s, Rare would return to make Donkey Kong's next official title once again, Donkey Kong 64, released in November 1999, bringing the Kongs over to a fully 3D experience. And once again, this intro is timeless. Through the DK rap, we're reintroduced to Donkey Kong and his entire crew, complete with brand new playable Kongs to join him on his new adventure. The plot isn't too different from the others, with DK's bananas and friends being stolen once again by the Kremlings and King K. Rule. This time, they have a weapon of mass destruction known as the Blastomatic that they plan to use to destroy the DK Isles. So it's up to Donkey Kong to find his friends, his golden bananas, and to stop the Kremlings from their conquest. Much of Rare's team this time around would be different from the staff that developed the original Donkey Kong Country games, and while at the time it was positively received, over the years, fans have looked at this game a little more critically, criticizing it for its overall bloat, the overutilization of collectibles, and its tedious minigames. Regardless, this would be Rare's final Donkey Kong title before they were officially purchased by Microsoft, leaving the Donkey Kong Country series untouched for 11 whole years. And then? Retro Studios in Texas has produced some great Metroid titles. But when they said they were ready for something new, we asked them to take one of the most treasured franchises in video game history and to make it magic again. If you listen, you can hear it coming. And after a decade of waiting, the next Donkey Kong Country title would be Donkey Kong Country Returns for the Nintendo Wii in 2010. This would be followed up by Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze for the Wii U, released in 2014. These games were developed by Retro Studios, best known for the Metroid Prime series, and until further notice, the Donkey Kong Country series still seems to be in their care to this day. These games are fantastic, introducing new gameplay mechanics while keeping the old intact, gorgeous new level themes to go with the power of the new consoles at the time, and the music for both titles carries the same atmospheric jungle vibes from the original games with some outstanding remixes from the original soundtracks. They even brought back David Wise to compose for Tropical Freeze, and in my opinion, it's his best work. But in Nintendo fashion, they simplify the Donkey Kong lore considerably, at least in comparison to when Rare was at the head with all the new characters they introduced. 
But Donkey Kong Country Returns does bring in a new set of villains known as the Tiki Tak Tribe, who hypnotize the animals of Donkey Kong Island and steal the bananas once again. The sequel, Tropical Freeze, changes the banana in distress formula a little bit and introduces a group of Viking villains known as the Snowmads, who attempt to conquer Donkey Kong Island by summoning an ice dragon. On DK's birthday, no less. Wow, what an asshole. After being blown away by the ice dragon, the Kongs go off on another adventure to return to their island and reclaim their home from the Snowmads. And if you have a Nintendo Switch, I highly suggest grabbing the revamped Tropical Freeze. It doesn't pull its punches on difficulty and truly tests your platforming skills. On Mentok, how could you skip over 11 years of Donkey Kong games? Okay, okay, let's rewind the clock a little bit. Donkey Kong didn't technically go missing after Donkey Kong 64. Of course, he was very present within Mario spin-offs, sports titles, and served as a major character within the Super Smash Bros. series. But there were a few new games that spawned starring this modern Donkey Kong that filled the gaps between the mainline country titles. Like Mario vs. Donkey Kong, a spiritual successor to the Donkey Kong Game Boy title. This was developed for the Game Boy Advance and released in the summer of 2004. Originally, this was supposed to be an updated version of the Game Boy Donkey Kong entitled Donkey Kong Plus, and players would have been able to design and create levels on the GameCube, which could then be transferred back to the Game Boy Advance via a link cable. But instead, Nintendo released Mario vs. Donkey Kong, pitting the two against each other once again. The story features Mario as the owner of his own toy company where he sells toy versions of himself in the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario is full of himself and I will never be convinced otherwise. Donkey Kong sees the toy in a TV commercial and decides to go buy one, only to find out that they're sold out. I know DK, I've been there. But in his rage, he breaks into Mario's factory and steals all of the mini Marios. So this is the main conflict of the game and it leads to Mario pursuing him to get all of the toys back. And once you beat the final boss stage, Donkey Kong breaks down in sadness, but the game ends on a wholesome note as Mario gives him his own free mini Mario. The level setup and gameplay is very similar to Game Boy Donkey Kong, where you find keys to open locked doors to get to the next stage, along with the occasional DK boss fight. So cutting in to interject a little bit, but on September 14th, a Nintendo Direct announced a remake for Mario vs. Donkey Kong. So we're going to get a new coat of paint for this game, which I'm excited for. It's a start, and maybe this will revive this whole concept of, of Mario vs. Donkey Kong as it should have been, a successor to Donkey Kong 94. So if you want to see more of this, go support that game when it comes out February 2024. Alright, back to my original video. The gameplay is simple, but this is a lot of fun, and I think it's still the best in the series. Yes, series. There are six other Mario vs. Donkey Kong titles. But the gameplay changes rather drastically after the first game, with the player controlling mini Marios to obtain keys and solve puzzles instead. In the second game, we even see Pauline make her first return since 1994, as she gets kidnapped by the new DK this time around, Enraged since Pauline seems to like the Mario toy better than his new mini Donkey Kong toy. We discover in these games that Donkey Kong has a very short temper, since most of them start with him getting pissed off at something minor before kidnapping Pauline. There are also a couple of other handheld puzzle games starring Donkey Kong that are now collectively referred to as the DK series. The first is called DK, King of Swing, released for the Game Boy Advance in 2005. Donkey Kong and his friends are holding a festival called the Jungle Jam, where they collect medals as prizes during contests involving barrel breaking and climbing. King K. Rool comes to spoil the fun by stealing all the medals, so it's up to Donkey Kong to get them back. The gameplay is a little different from other DK titles we've seen up to this point, with the players swinging and climbing with Donkey Kong along pegboards to get him to the top of the level. Once you've completed all the levels in a world, you can face the boss and move on to the next set of levels. Oh, and look, the Crystal Coconuts from the television series make an appearance. There was one other title in the series known as DK Jungle Climber, this time on the Nintendo DS, keeping the same gameplay mechanics. I really prefer the art style from the original since the cuter aesthetic seems to fit the lower stakes. While these games are published on handheld, there is another set of Donkey Kong games on the GameCube. Donkey Konga, a rhythm game where you get to play the bongos alongside DK and Diddy complete with its own special controller called the DK Bongos, and who are you if you haven't tried to play Smash Brothers with this thing? I know you're wondering about the gripping story and lore of Donkey Konga, so here goes. Donkey Kong and Diddy find some mysterious bongos one day while chilling at the beach, so they take them to Cranky, who explains what bongos are. The two try to play them and... <gasps> Magic bongos! 
So the two of them have it in their heads that if they play these well enough, then they can go on to afford as many bananas as they could eat. So let the practice begin. And that's pretty much it. In the actual game, you play these drums to songs from Nintendo franchises like Mario and Zelda, but of course, there's licensed music as well. Nintendo made sure they were able to get mileage out of these drums though, because this game got two sequels, Donkey Konga 2 and Donkey Konga 3, which was a Japanese exclusive. This is the only game where you'll get to see Donkey Kong jamming out to the Naruto soundtrack. Donkey Kong Jungle Beat was somewhat of a follow-up to this series, released in 2005 for the GameCube, but this time it was a platformer that also supported the DK bongos. There's really no story to talk about here other than DK just going on a rampage to become the king of the jungle. Interestingly enough, this project was directed by Yoshiaki Koizumi, and this was the last game made by this team before they would go on to develop Super Mario Galaxy. And how could I forget Donkey Kong Barrel Blast, a kart racer for the Nintendo Wii? This would be Donkey Kong's first and last kart racer, and it's still crazy to me that Diddy got one before he did, but let's save that story for another video. In this title, Donkey Kong and his friends race through the skies on rocket-powered bongos, and much like Mario Kart, you're able to use items to trip up the competition. But you're probably wondering why they chose rocket-powered bongos as the vehicles here. Why not just regular karts? Well, you can also use the DK bongos to play this game. So slight correction here, you can't use the DK bongos to play this game, but thanks to CHFGN for his video on restoring the bongos to its proper glory, check his video out. This is the footage that you're seeing here, so he managed to restore it via emulation. But at some point it looks like Nintendo was trying to make the bongos compatible with this game. I think it's a missed opportunity, but I just wanted to make the correction nonetheless. Okay, back to the video. So let's end this with the latest version of Donkey Kong, featured in the Super Mario Bros. As movie. Even though I plan to make a video covering all the new versions of the characters within this film, it wouldn't have felt right if I didn't mention it at all. So minor spoilers for the Mario movie. Donkey Kong is voiced by Seth Rogen in this film and is introduced as the son of Cranky Kong, the leader of the Jungle Kingdom. I covered the son and grandson debate in the last DK video, so let's not retread that ground. But in this movie, Mario, Peach, and Toad travel to the Jungle Kingdom to form an alliance with the Kongs for their fight against Bowser. Cranky agrees to lend them the strength of the Kong army, but under one condition. Mario must defeat Donkey Kong in a duel. So Mario and DK are instant rivals once again, this time on the big screen. This leads to quite a few callbacks to the original Donkey Kong, and there are even minor adjustments to his current design that make him look like a mixture of both the modern and classic renditions. Miyamoto has stated these design changes were made to make DK look a little more comedic in nature. There were credible rumors back in 2021 that Nintendo and Illumination were already planning on a follow-up Donkey Kong movie. While this hasn't been 100% confirmed, I'd say this is a safe bet considering the amount of world building that went into the Jungle Kingdom and the Kongs in this movie. So while Mario has gotten a lot of hype this year, I foresee some focus is coming for this classic, cherished Nintendo character. With Tropical Freeze turning 10 years old next year, it's only a matter of time until we see what's next for Donkey Kong. Maybe a little something to coincide with the Donkey Kong expansion coming to Universal Studios Japan in 2024. There are rumors of a minecart ride that will allow park guests to experience the chaos of these minecart levels from Donkey Kong Country. And of course, there's the opportunity to walk through the jungle where the Kongs reside. Diddy Kong was introduced as the apprentice of Donkey Kong, one of his biggest fans that strives to be a video game hero much like DK. You first encounter him within Donkey Kong Country for the Super Nintendo, with DK on a quest to get his stolen bananas back from King K. Rule and the Kremlings. The first level is jungle hijinks, and not too far from DK's empty banana stash is a frantic Diddy Kong stuck inside a barrel. But once you toss this barrel and free him, you not only have a trusted companion to join you on your adventure, but a whole other playable character with unique skills. How did Rare come up with this new Kong, and how did they go with the idea to put DK on the back burner and have Diddy star in his own title? And what about his girlfriend, Dixie Kong? Let's get into it. I'm the Mentalk, and welcome to Origin Oracle, everyone. Kick back, grab a snack, and let's head back in time. <laughs> Thank you.
So as I mentioned before, Diddy Kong debuted in the Super Nintendo classic Donkey Kong Country, released in November 1994. My previous Donkey Kong video is a pretty deep dive into the history of Rare and how they managed to develop such a title, so this video is going to focus more on the origins of Diddy himself. There's a whole four page backstory within the instructions manual for Donkey Kong Country which provides some context on why Diddy is stuck in a barrel in the first place. It's a dark and stormy night but somebody's still gotta watch over Donkey Kong's banana stash. With Diddy as his apprentice, Donkey Kong, in his condescending voice, tells him to take point on the night watch, leaving him alone in the darkness to ward off any threats. And of course in that moment the Kremlings ambush poor Diddy who tries to fight back with his signature summer assault move, but they turn out to be too much for him and end up sealing him within a nearby barrel before discarding it into the jungle. In the morning, Donkey Kong and Cranky Kong discover both his horde of bananas and Diddy are gone, which begins the adventure of Donkey Kong Country. And even though we don't see these events play out within the game, unless you're playing the Game Boy Advance port, I find it cool that they didn't go with the idea of Diddy being captive the entire time. Also, this is another minor detail, but the barrel is labeled DK, which lines up with the story pretty nicely since the Kremlings presumably grabbed the nearest barrel while they were raiding the banana horde. Anyway, with Diddy rescued, this duo goes on their adventure to get all their bananas back, but instead of just having another DK to play with, Rare gave both of these Kongs their own unique abilities. Donkey Kong is the powerhouse of the two, able to take down the more brutish enemies in the Kremlin army, and if positioned properly, can reveal hidden stashes in the ground by using his hand slap. In comparison, Diddy is built as the speedier, more agile Kong, and was given the ability to spread faster, jump higher, and actually has a smaller hitbox than DK. But he has a hard time taking down the bigger enemies like armies, crushes, and clumps. So while the manual may refer to Diddy as a Donkey Kong wannabe, he has quite a few useful abilities at his disposal. I've always been drawn to using the speedier types in video games anyway. Mentok has an obsession with Amy? Who told you that? Alright, so we know the team at Rare created Diddy Kong, but for what purpose? Well, before he got his final design, this character was originally meant to be a redesign for Donkey Kong Jr. Thanks to the lead designer of Donkey Kong Country, Greg Mills, we have an idea of what transpired before we got these versions of the characters. So first, Rare pitched the idea of Donkey Kong vs Super Wario, a story where Wario turns Mario to stone and steals a time machine Mario invented in order to try to rule Nintendo Land. Whatever Nintendo Land is. So I guess Wario is trying to take over that amusement park from that one Wii U game. I've been dying for a Nintendo Land port or some type of sequel because this game was so much fun. So a parrot informs Donkey Kong of the situation and he races off to help. But Nintendo ended up rejecting this concept since they wanted Donkey Kong to square up with a new set of villains. And this led to the follow-up pitch from Rare called Donkey Kong and the Golden Bananas. Much like the plot of the final game, the Kremlings steal Donkey Kong's golden bananas, but this time around, Donkey Kong is the one that gets ambushed by a Kremlin instead named Corporal Krizzle. This name sounds like something straight out of the early 2000s. A shizzle, my nizzle. <laughs> I'm telling you, Julie. So a character called Grandpa Kong tracks down Donkey Kong and encourages him to go retrieve the golden banana, which leads to DK summoning Donkey Kong Jr. to help. And I'm sure it's pretty obvious, but Grandpa Kong here would eventually become Cranky Kong. But Nintendo wasn't too keen on the idea of using such a drastically different design for Jr., so Rare was given a choice to make it look more like his original design, or make this design a brand new character. So obviously they went with the latter, with Rare believing the design fit the rebooted DK world they were developing. And so, Dinky Kong was born. Who? Mentok, you're so silly. But seriously, this is not me making a joke. Greg Mail stated in a 2010 interview that Rare had a ton of names that were suggested by their team, with Dinky Kong being one of them. In fact, they settled with Dinky Kong, but were advised by their legal teams to change it to Diddy, which was most likely derived from the English slang for small. It can also refer to a woman's breast, but I'm gonna assume that that's not what they had in mind for our boy Diddy here. I couldn't find any more details on this legal suggestion, but maybe they were trying to avoid a potential lawsuit from Jackson Guitars due to their Jackson Dinky guitar. Let me know if you have any other guesses in the comments. And if you're curious about other potential names for Diddy, Rare came up with Diet DK? DK Light and Tichy Kong. And as for the name Dinky Kong, it would end up being used for the Japanese version of Kitty Kong, who would make his first appearance in Donkey Kong Country 3. So with a new hero established, Diddy Kong would be fully implemented within Donkey Kong Country, initially to serve as that extra hit for the player. Rare took inspiration from the mushroom power-up from Mario games with this in mind, and the goal was to implement a health system without cluttering up the screen with hearts or health bars. So very early on in the game, the player will discover that Diddy can take a hit for DK, 
and vice versa. So much like a lot of the Mario cast, there was some confusion with Diddy's relation to Donkey Kong for a while. As of right now, he's considered Donkey Kong's best friend and companion, but back in the 90s, he was referred to as DK's nephew several times. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. The English version of Super Smash Bros. for the N64 states in Donkey Kong's profile that Donkey Kong and Mario started out as arch rivals, but they've patched things up in recent years. These days, DK spends his time searching the jungle for bananas instead of kidnapping beautiful maidens. Huh. So is the DK in the original Smash a toy version of Cranky? Okay, let me not start this up again. So the last <laughs> so the last line in his profile says that the other members of the Kong family have cashed in on DK's fame as well, including his favorite nephew, Diddy. Strangely enough, on Rare's old website around the time of Donkey Kong 64, they also refer to Diddy Kong as Donkey Kong's nephew. But then in 2003, the Prima Games Guide for the GBA version of Donkey Kong has them as cousins. My inner conspiracy theorist thinks everyone associated with the Donkey Kong franchise was actively trying to confuse fans on his family. Get some help. The response to Donkey Kong Country was overwhelmingly positive as the game broke several sales records in a short amount of time. With all the new and cutting edge technology for 3D graphics at their disposal, Rare knew very early on that they would be making a sequel to Donkey Kong Country. But this time around, they would remove Donkey Kong from the picture intending to surprise players by not only making Diddy Kong the star, but introducing a brand new character to take the place of DK. Super Donkey Kong! Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. Get it? This game was released a year after the original Donkey Kong Country, putting Diddy Kong at the forefront. This time, the story was slimmed down to two pages, with a captive DK sitting right in the center. Our story begins with Donkey Kong relaxing on the beach, drinking a banana milkshake. Now I'm craving one. As he dozes off to sleep, Cranky gives him a nice bonk on the head to chastise him for lazing around so much. Even stars get time off! muttered Donkey Kong rubbing his head. I never did, said Cranky proudly. Whisking off maidens and throwing barrels around the place seven days a week I was. We also find out from Cranky that Diddy is off somewhere with his new girlfriend before wandering off to finally let DK sleep. So night approaches and Donkey Kong still hasn't returned home, leading Diddy and his new girlfriend Dixie Kong to go out to go look for him, only to find a note laying on his smashed beach chair. To the yeller-bellied land loving Kong family, ha! We've got the big monkey. If you want him back, you scurvy dogs, you'll have to hand over the banana horde. Captain K. Rule. So Diddy, Dixie, Cranky, and Wrinkly Kong, Cranky's wife who makes her first appearance in this game, all ponder on how to handle the situation, but Diddy steps forward to take on the challenge of stopping K. Rule and rescuing Donkey Kong. Cranky is a bit doubtful that Diddy can do it alone, but Dixie agrees to go alongside him, and so begins Diddy's conquest. Cranky is also quoted here saying that this story is even worse than Donkey Kong Country's. We need to get you your own game again. So this time around, Rare wanted to focus on a pirate theme for this game, with much of the level design being influenced by the golden age of piracy that occurred in the late 1600s and early 1700s. This includes multiple pirate ship levels and more of a focus on the use of water within the course of the game. They also opted to make this game a little more challenging than the original. The Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest. It's even tougher than the original. Greg Mills admitted it was risky by taking Donkey Kong out of the picture and going with Diddy as the lead instead. And with the introduction of Dixie, the team wanted a character with even more unique skills. And while we're at it, let's talk about Dixie Kong. This origin oracle will be for her as well. Rare had the idea to implement a female character before they came up with her design. But by introducing her ponytail into her final design, they were able to come up with several gameplay mechanics that revolved around that hairstyle. So to create Dixie, they started with Diddy Kong's model and added a ponytail, new clothes, and other feminine features. <clears throat> uh. Smash. This time, Rare came up with nearly 50 different names for their new character like Daisy, Dandy, Dippy, and Ducky. Oh, and let's not forget Dicky Licky. What? And they almost went with the name Diddy in at one point before finally settling for Dixie. Once again, Nintendo let Rare do their thing with this title, having even less involvement this time around, but Miyamoto did have some input on Dixie's character design. Diddy has an identical moveset, keeping his original speed and jumping abilities from the first game. Dixie, on the other hand, was given the ability to hover with her ponytail, giving the player a more diverse moveset this time around between the two characters. Rare would also add team-up abilities, allowing the characters to pick each other up and throw one another to reach inaccessible places and hidden items. 
So after many trials and tribulations, Diddy and Dixie find themselves on Crocodile Isle, where Captain K. Rule awaits on his airship. The two battle it out with their nemesis. Also, I think it's a nice touch with DK strung up on the ceiling here. After a long battle, Diddy and Dixie are victorious and manage to release DK so he can get the final uppercut on K. Rule, launching him into the water below to be devoured by the sharks. So the day is saved, and if you've been hunting down these video game hero coins, Cranky will weigh Diddy up as a hero against the big leagues like Yoshi and Mario himself. Link! You must find me! There's a secret area within Crocodile Isle known as the Lost World that contains a boss level called Crocodile Core, the power source of the entire island. Here, Diddy and Dixie can take on Captain K. Rule one last time, who's still wet and covered in reeds from his time with the sharks. But after dodging all the blasts from his blunderbuss, he'll explode, sending him flying once again, putting Crocodile Isle out of commission as Diddy, Dixie, and Donkey Kong overlook its destruction on the cliffside, ending this game once and for all. We do witness K. Rule laughing on a raft as he escapes into the sunset, but once he's gone, this is one of the most peaceful screens in this game. Yo, why is your girl riding on his back though? Even after taking these risks on new characters picking up the mantle, Diddy's Conquest would become the second best-selling game of 1995, only beaten by Yoshi's Island, with this game often heralded as the best title in the Donkey Kong Country trilogy. And I wholeheartedly agree with this opinion just on the music alone. David Wise returns to compose the soundtrack for this game, and some of these bangers are timeless. Tell me your favorite song from this game in the comments and why it's Forest Interlude. So after the success of Donkey Kong Country 2, Rare handed off the next project to a brand new team, comprised of Andrew Collard and Paul Weaver as the designers, who would take on the task of creating Donkey Kong Country 3. Something wild is coming. Something you wouldn't expect. <laughs> Why? Well cool, with Donkey Kong saved, I can't wait to roam around as the king of the jungle again. Just kidding, Donkey Kong gets kidnapped again. Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, released for the Super Nintendo in 1996. So once again, Rare decided to throw a curveball and had Donkey Kong Country 3 star Dixie Kong, this time with her massive baby cousin, Kitty Kong. Diddy and Dixie both get more screen time than DK in his own trilogy. But I'll once again refer to this lovely instructions manual for this butt-clenching lore. So months after their last victory over Captain K. Rule, the Kongs are still celebrating with lazy-ass DK hanging out in his hammock sipping banana milkshakes. One morning, Dixie decides to go visit Diddy and notices his room was completely empty with only a note left behind. Dear Dixie, gone exploring the island with DK. Back tomorrow, Diddy. Though Dixie thinks it's odd at first that these two would go any further than the beach because they are lazy, she decides to wait until the next day to see if they turn up. They didn't. So Dixie takes it upon herself to search for the duo, asking the other Kongs about their whereabouts. Monkey Kong, the coolest Kong on the island, tells her that the only visitor he's had all week was Kitty Kong, who's sitting in the room chewing on a tire by the way. So she decides to take her strong baby cousin out on the adventure to help her track down DK and Diddy. Gameplay wise, Dixie's controls are more or less the same, with Kitty Kong playing a little bit more like Donkey Kong from the first Donkey Kong Country, but he has a few abilities from Diddy, like carrying the barrel in front of him like a shield and having a longer roll distance. So while the Kremlings are the villains again, this time around they have a new leader named Chaos. Okay, let's be real, Chaos is not their ruler. It's a robot of some sort being controlled by the true mastermind, Baron K. Rulenstein. Or is it Stein? It's pronounced Frankenstein. I gotta love how he keeps coming back with a different name and title every time. But look at that, DK and Diddy were being used to power this robot the whole time. Okay, Dr. Rulebotnik, I see you. I don't know, I thought that one was clever. By the way, there's a new group introduced here known as the Brothers Bear that assists Dixie and Kitty on their journey, and it's fully comprised of bears with names starting with the letter B. While it's not fully confirmed, I have to wonder if this group is what inspired the creation of Banjo from Banjo-Kazooie. So once again, you're gonna have to go on a collectathon to unlock the true ending of the game, grabbing all the bonus coins and DK coins. Oh yeah, and I hope you've been freeing these banana birds during your adventure too. You can then take the fight to K. Rulingstein's submarine, where Dixie and Kitty take him on in another epic boss fight, but just like the other games, he manages to escape. Get all the DK coins and Funky will send you to secret levels that contain the last few banana birds, and after freeing every single one, Dixie and Kitty get an audience with the Banana Queen, ending their adventure once and for all as this giant bird drops a massive eggshell on K. Rulingstein. 
It's kind of anticlimactic, I know, but I'll be honest with you guys, I never had the patience or fortitude to get to the ending of this game. Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, like the previous titles, broke over a million copies sold, with many fans arguing that this game was hindered by being more of the same. Not to mention, the Nintendo 64 hit the market two months prior to the release of this, so the release of true 3D graphics are said to have overshadowed this title a little bit. Personally, I find the game enjoyable, so I won't add to the discourse, but if you're subscribed to Nintendo Switch Online, it's pretty easy to get your hands on this game. Before I move on, they completely massacred Dixie in the television series. I'll walk the rest of the way with my buddy Dix! <coughs> oh shit! So in the new age of full 3D graphics and the rise of the Nintendo 64, of course Rare would work on Donkey Kong's next big title, Donkey Kong 64, which released in November 1999. And while Diddy is a playable character within the game, Donkey Kong returns to center stage. So instead, the N64 game I actually want to talk about would come out two years before this, once again with Diddy Kong as the star. Diddy Kong Racing! Diddy Kong Racing. Around this time, the team at Rare split up to create two new games. The first was a fighting game, which would be Killer Instinct Gold, the third entry in their Killer Instinct series, and the other was a racing game. But it didn't start off as Diddy Kong Racing as we know it. So the year is 1996, and Rare wanted to explore other game genres and branch out. Strangely enough, there was a rumor that the game's initial concept was going to be a real-time strategy game with a caveman time travel theme, but Lee Musgrave, who worked as a 3D artist on Diddy Kong Racing, has confirmed in a 2022 interview that this wasn't true, but for some reason it's still listed in the development section on the Wikipedia page. Hmm, maybe my high school teachers were right about Wikipedia this whole time. Musgrave does mention that he worked on a few catapult models for a completely unrelated strategy game in the style of Command & Conquer for about a month, before the team decided to move on to their 3D racing game. So technically speaking, the two have no relation. The racing game itself was planned as a follow-up to one of Rare's old NES titles from 1988, RC Pro-Am. They introduced all new characters to be featured and titled the game Pro-Am 64 which would be slotted as their holiday title for 1997. But the team felt that this intellectual property and the new characters weren't enough to stand on their own. So they came up with the idea to rebrand with some Nintendo razzle-dazzle and included Diddy Kong as the feature. Nintendo was all in with the idea and according to Musgrave, he says, quote, Nintendo enjoyed the fact that we chose Diddy Kong over Donkey Kong. I think that it was us trying to build on the fact that Diddy was ours and DK was theirs. And so Diddy Kong Racing was born. And even though Diddy is the star character, there's a whole squad of new personalities from Rare. This would also be the very first appearance of two major characters that would go on to get their own games, Banjo the Bear and Conquer the Squirrel. Or Conquer in his sober days. I, and I'll probably see you sometime next week. I gotta go home. Uh, I'll go this way. Oh. There's even a little story to go along with it, and since this is the Mentalk channel, you know I have to go over it. So Diddy Kong is chilling at the treehouse and receives a letter from a faraway land asking for his help. It's from his old friend Timber the Tiger, who's having some trouble at home with an evil intergalactic pig wizard named Wizpig, who is attempting to take over his island. Diddy races off to help, but not before recruiting some of his friends, Banjo and Conker. A curious Kremlin named Crunch is suspicious of Diddy's sudden movements and decides to go after him, which explains why he's playable. Meanwhile, on Timber's island, the inhabitants band together while anticipating Diddy's arrival, which leads into the events of the game. And yes, we're defeating this evil wizard pig in races, just to clarify. This game set itself apart from other racing titles like Mario Kart because the characters have multiple vehicles they can use depending on the race, like cars, hovercrafts, and planes. And the main scenario mode is called Adventure Mode, where the player wins races and grabs collectibles to get the opportunity to face off against the boss in each of the main four worlds. And all of this leads up to the final race with Wizpig, who, once defeated, takes it like a sore loser and terrorizes the cast on the beach while they're celebrating. And using his spaceship, he heads back into space, leading to the final world, Future Funland. So Diddy and his friends will have to complete more races in this area before getting the chance to face Wizpig who pulls out all the stops this time, but once again, the team is victorious. I guess all the commotion from the race causes Wizpig's rocket to malfunction, sending him into the cold, dark abyss of space. But we do see his spaceship fly by at the very end as he laughs his way off screen, so I guess Wizpig has been terrorizing other planets ever since. This game was insanely popular, selling 4.5 million copies worldwide. 
But unfortunately, there still hasn't been a sequel to this game. Allegedly, two sequels were planned, one known as Diddy Kong Pilot for the Game Boy Advance, which got leaked online in 2011 by a former Rare employee. The other game was Donkey Kong Racing for the GameCube, first announced at E3 2001, which would have built on the Diddy Kong Racing formula while including more of the Kongs as playable characters. But in 2003, Rare would be purchased by Microsoft, which made their relationship with Nintendo a little awkward. In 2004, Diddy Kong Racing Adventure was a sequel game pitched by Climax Studios for the GameCube. This project also never saw the light of day. P2P Online, a video game archivist on YouTube, managed to get his hands on a prototype a few years back, and talks a little bit more on this if you'd like to check his video out. But long story short, for reasons unknown, Nintendo decided not to pick up this pitch. It wouldn't be until 2007 where we'd finally see Nintendo acknowledge Diddy Kong Racing again with the Nintendo DS remake, Diddy Kong Racing DS. And they even managed to get Rare to come back to develop this title since Microsoft wasn't in the handheld market. So I guess they deemed this one fair game for Rare to work on. And while the game is more or less the same, just with a coat of fresh paint, they would replace the Banjo and Conker characters with Dixie Kong and her younger sister, Tiny Kong. So I guess Nintendo wasn't a fan of Conker's alcohol problem. But this title would be the last time we'd see Diddy Kong take the spotlight. But of course, he's far from an abandoned character. He and Dixie would receive the Mario spin-off treatment, being featured in multiple sports titles, but they'd also be playable characters in other spin-off titles like DK King of Swing, DK Jungle Climber, and the Donkey Konga series. Diddy Kong would be inducted into the Smash roster with the release of Super Smash Bros. Brawl in 2008, and has kept his slot as a fighter ever since. And all of this was prior to the 2010 revival of the Donkey Kong Country series, with Retro Studios developing Donkey Kong Country Returns. For the first time in the series since the first Donkey Kong Country game, DK and Diddy team up once again to get their banana horde back from the Tiki Tak tribe. So while there isn't a huge story to write home about here, this game does manage to give some focus on DK and Diddy's friendship, which has seemingly come a long way from DK condescendingly putting Diddy on Nightwatch. As for Dixie, she would make a return as a playable character a few years later in Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. While they're all celebrating DK's birthday, another group of troublemakers known as the Snowmads attempt a hostile takeover of Kong Island. So alongside Donkey, Diddy, and Cranky, Dixie brings her versatile ponytail back into the series for the first time since Donkey Kong Country 3. And for the first time in the Donkey Kong Country series, a playable Cranky. And once again, I have to acknowledge the Super Mario Brazas movie. When Mario journeys to the Jungle Kingdom and has his little face-off with Donkey Kong, we get a brief glimpse of Diddy alongside Dixie and Swanky in the crowd cheering for DK. Now, while there's no clear details on the relationship between DK and Diddy in this universe, we see Diddy clearly is Donkey Kong's biggest fan once again. And in my previous Donkey Kong video, I covered some rumors about a potential Donkey Kong spin-off movie, but that's still yet to be confirmed. But if Nintendo and Illumination does decide to pick that up, I think we'll see Diddy and Dixie in the context of this whole new Mario universe they're building. What? Snip snip gonna clip. Make you my sweet and sexy chimp. <laughs> Meet the Kongs. They're not all related. Oh my god, stop bro, I'm stuck! There are some biological ties between some of the members of this crew like Donkey Kong, Cranky Kong, and DK Jr., but for the most part, the name Kong is meant to identify their species or tribe. Their home is known as Donkey Kong Island, and oftentimes we see territorial disputes between them and other tribes in the area like the Kremlings, the Tiki Tak tribe, and the Snowmats. But this video is going to tackle the rest of the Kongs, including some of the weird distant relatives that you probably haven't heard of. By the time we're done, you'll all be official Kongologists. I just made that up. So we'll go in chronological order here, starting with this guy. This is Mini Donkey Kong, who appeared in the Game & Watch version of Donkey Kong in 1982. I know some of you are already thinking that this doesn't count, but hear me out. Certain Game & Watch titles came with a built-in alarm function, much like traditional digital watches. But the cool thing is that they each had a specific alarm animation that would trigger whenever the alarm went off. And in the case of the Donkey Kong Game & Watch title, this mini Donkey Kong is seen ringing a bell when that alarm goes off. This little guy predates the creation of Donkey Kong Jr., so we could retroactively say that this is Jr., but I thought this would be cool to start with. Maybe this is DK Jr.'s older brother or sister who gave birth to the current Donkey Kong, as I theorized. Alright, moving on. This random gorilla is Uncle Julius. I have no idea who this is. I said I'd talk about all the Kongs, so here we are. 
Uncle Julius was a character introduced in the Donkey Kong Jr. segment of the 1983 television series Saturday Supercade. I've covered this TV show in both the Mario Origins and Classic DK video if you want to know a little bit more, but it had segments that were animated versions of popular video games at the time, Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. included. Uncle Julius is the uncle of Junior, appearing at the beginning of the episode Gorilla Ghost to tell Junior the story of the Gorilla Ghost. So this episode involves Junior, his friend Bones, and Uncle Julius trying to figure out the true identity of the Gorilla Ghost, but he's never seen again after this episode, leading me to believe he got poached in the jungle somewhere. Next! <clears throat> This is Candy Kong, introduced in Donkey Kong Country as the manager of Candy's Save Point. Just as the name suggests, players can go to her spots on the map to save their progress. But Candy here is actually the banana of Donkey Kong's eye. That's literally what the instructions booklet says, both for the original game and the Game Boy Advance remake. Funny enough, it doesn't say she's explicitly DK's girlfriend. Over the years, she's described as Donkey Kong's love interest, but it's not until Donkey Kong 64 where Cranky says in her bio, that darn donkey has all the luck. His girl Candy waits around her hut, always willing to offer her musical help to that undeserving son of mine and his fancy polygonal friends. There's questionable details in this one sentence, but I still need more proof that they're actually a couple. Compared to Diddy and Dixie's relationship, there seems to be a lot of gray area here. Like even her trophy in Smash Brothers Brawl says, Donkey Kong's rumored girlfriend, although nobody is quite sure if the rumor is true. DK is a certified f boy. Sensational. Candy early on in development had alternative names like Blondie Kong or Honey Kong, and she was also slated to appear in Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest, in some form or fashion, but according to Rare, they thought her inclusion would clash with the new Diddy and Dixie relationship introduced in that game and she was promptly removed. But she plays a much larger role in the Donkey Kong Country television series, where she and DK are officially declared a couple, though her design is completely different from what we see in-game. Candy would also have a minor role in Donkey Kong 64 with this redesign, and she runs Candy's music shop where she can sell the Kong's instruments that can be used in-game to defeat their foes. <clears throat> well, hello, Donkey. You just take it easy and let Candy tell you how she's gonna make you feel real good. Stand a little closer, Donkey, and I'll show you how to use your instrument. How did I miss this as a kid? Last time we'd see Candy aside from the Smash games as a cameo is in Donkey Kong Barrel Blast and DK Jungle Climber way back in 2007, again as a non-playable character. So maybe one day we'll see her play a more prominent role in one of these games. Just as a heads up, most of these characters I'm going to mention have cameos in the Smash Brothers series, so whenever I mention the last time they're featured in a game, I'll more or less be referring to their last appearance in the Donkey Kong franchise and possibly Mario spin-offs. Next! Next up is the coolest Kong of the bunch, Funky Kong, also introduced in Donkey Kong Country as one of DK's friends. He's quite the favorite among Donkey Kong fans for his laid-back demeanor and serves as the mechanic on Donkey Kong Island, helping the team within various titles by creating vehicles and inventions that help them on their journey. In Donkey Kong Country, Funky is the proprietor of Funky's Flights. Stop at one of his shops and he can help you travel between worlds that you've already completed within the game. In the Game Boy Advance remake, Funky sets up a fishing minigame that allows DK and Diddy to catch as many fish as possible before the time runs out, and he'll reward them with collectible photographs for the player's scrapbook. He is also one of the more prominent characters in the Donkey Kong Country television series, and uh, just see for yourself. Uh, anyone can make the moves, Donkey Dude. Come on, give it another try. This man from 90s, we see Funky mostly play the same role within the series, especially in Donkey Kong Country 3, where throughout the game the player can unlock different vehicles from Funky, which helps Dixie and Kitty Kong access new levels. In Donkey Kong 64, Funky decides to go from mechanic to arms dealer, becoming the owner of a weapons store to sell ammo and other upgrades to the Kongs to assist them in their battle against the Kremlings. He'd make minor appearances in the DK spin-off series and some of the Mario spin-off titles like Mario Kart Wii and Mario Super Sluggers, but it wasn't until Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze that we'd see him back in his shop helping out the Kongs by selling them various items for their journey. The Switch re-release of Tropical Freeze even features Funky Kong as a playable character for the very first time in the series. Though his playstyle is mainly for beginner players, it gives him a very versatile skill set to easily traverse these levels. I highly recommend this game by the way. 
And as for Funky's latest appearance, we see him in a tiny cameo in the Super Mario Bros. movie, driving his cart in the background. Alright, so here's a fun one. Donkey Kong Land was more or less the Game Boy rendition of Donkey Kong Country, but in my opinion it can stand on its own as a different experience. It was released around the same time as Donkey Kong Country, so while there weren't any exclusive Kongs within this handheld title, there were unused enemies, animal friends, and this mysterious Kong that got scrapped from the final product. This particular Kong is unnamed, but was part of a Donkey Kong Land preview printed in Nintendo Power Volume 69 back in February 1995. And this wasn't a minor feature either, he takes up about a quarter of these two pages, so it's interesting we'd never see this guy in any of the handheld games. But leave your theories in the comments. All senior citizens should have life alert. Wrinkly Kong, the wife of Cranky Kong, debuting in Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest, as the new manager of the save points. She runs the Kong College and can provide Diddy and Dixie with some hints to help them on their quest. In Donkey Kong Country 3, Wrinkly officially retires from her teaching job at Kong College and moves to her save cave where the player can once again visit her to save their progress. It's also here where Diddy and Dixie return the banana birds they rescued during their journey, which helps get the true ending of the game. One cool thing about Wrinkly here is if you head into her save cave, sometimes she can be seen playing her Nintendo 64. And you'll hear the theme for Peach's Castle in the background for Mario 64. This is just prime advertising right here. Sometime after the events of Donkey Kong Country 3, Wrinkly Die. dies. Yeah, Rare actually had the balls to do this. In Donkey Kong 64, Wrinkly appears as a ghost and once again provides hints to our heroes to help them track down golden bananas in the game. But funny enough, Nintendo committed to this decision because every Wrinkly appearance from that point on still has her as a ghost. She's even a playable racer in Donkey Kong Barrel Blast for the Nintendo Wii. But before we move on, I'll refer to a little interesting fact from her Smash Bros. profile. Wrinkly first appeared as director of Kong College, where she provided game hints. Did you know King K. Rool was also a student of hers? And here he is making violent robots and weapons of mass destruction. What were you teaching him, Wrinkly? Mythological hero Achilles. Not accept that. Okay. This is Swanky Kong. Introduced in Diddy's Conquest, Swanky is the host of a game show he calls Swanky's Bonus Bonanza. If Diddy and Dixie answer his questions correctly, they can net some extra lives on their grueling adventure to save Donkey Kong. I always thought this was DK in disguise, but since he's kidnapped in this moment, it wouldn't make too much sense. He returns in Donkey Kong Country 3 in a circus tent known as Swanky's Sideshow, where Dixie and Diddy can pay coins to join throwing contests against Cranky. If they win, Swanky gives away prizes like banana and bear coins. So back in the day on Rare's website, I had to use the Wayback Machine for this, they give a little insight into Swanky here, stating that he has aimed for a career in showbiz since being bitten by the game show bug further back than he can remember. His original bonus Bonanza trivia quiz proved popular, but led to allegations of favoritism regarding Dixie and Diddy, prompting Swanky to branch out and tour the surrounding lands with a new sideshow featuring a triumphant Cranky as a defending champion. Despite his love for competition, Swanky is a generous soul, and true to tradition, never lets anyone walk away empty-handed. And even though we haven't seen Swanky much since Donkey Kong Country 3, the Game Boy Advance remake, he gets a couple of scenes in the Super Mario Bros. movie as a denizen of the Jungle Kingdom, which would be his first notable appearance in 17 years. I have to appreciate the little backstory Rare gave him in the past though. That's a thumbs up for me. This is Uncle Kong. I actually had no idea who this was at first, and that's because this character was exclusive to the Famitsu strategy guide for Donkey Kong Country 2. So technically, he's a Japan exclusive. He has a red jacket and a similar tie to DK, just with the letters UK on it, and he provides the players with various hints within the strategy guide. Helpful, right? Well, at the very end of this guide, he reveals that he's actually not a part of the Kong family and is just some guy who runs a banana stall in Osaka. Technically not a Kong, but his trickery earned him a spot on this list. Kitty Kong shares the spotlight with Dixie Kong in Donkey Kong Country 3, serving as the powerhouse between the two. He's the youngest Kong of the bunch and is revealed to be the cousin of Dixie. So before the start of the game, Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong are kidnapped to power a robot named Chaos, created by K. Rool. And during her search, Dixie asks Funky to help her locate DK and Diddy, who suggests that she should take Kitty Kong along with her to help, who is in Funky's shop chewing on a tire. There's not much else to say about Kitty aside from his strength and being a baby, so I'll end his segment on this little fact. In Japan, his name is Dinky Kong, one of the names they originally considered giving Diddy Kong before Rare's legal team advised them to change it for unknown reasons. It's good to see that name getting used somewhere in the world though. Kitty Kong can also be spotted in the Super Mario Bros. movie, 
if you look hard enough, racing in that kart scene, which would also be his first appearance in 17 years. So that covers each and every Kong from the Donkey Kong Country trilogy. Kind of. Everyone, I give you Donkey Kong. What is that? This is an enemy in the first Donkey Kong Country, and while not much is known about this terrifying thing, the instructions booklet describes it as a Kong reject orangutan. Rejected or not, I have to include this guy on our list. This is an interesting Kong because I'm not even sure if he's in league with the Kremlings or just mad at the other Kongs. In the Nintendo Power Player's Guide for Donkey Kong Country, it says, quote, that Mankey Kong is really mad, probably because he was never accepted as part of the Kong group. The word Mankey seems to be derived from the words mangy and skanky, and it's certainly befitting for such an unsightly ape, end quote. Give us a Mankey redemption arc, Nintendo. By the way, remember the Game Boy printer accessory from back in the day that allowed you to print cool stickers and other artwork from some of these games? Well, with the Game Boy Color version of Donkey Kong Country, you can print out your very own Mankey sticker. I have no idea why it's for the letter J, but yikes. Now that is every Kong from the Donkey Kong Country trilogy. But before I move on to the DK64 crew, there were a few Kongs that were exclusive to the Donkey Kong Country television series. The first is Bluster Kong, who runs Congo Bongo Island's barrel factory known as Bluster Barrel Works. Technically, his mother is the owner, but she doesn't appear in the show and has no name to report. So Bluster is meant to serve as an unlikable recurring character that's always flirting with Candy Kong. So while I wouldn't necessarily call him a friend of the other Kongs, he doesn't serve as the enemy either. But I have to mention his alter ego, Leo Luster, that appears in the episode Hunka Hunka Burning Bluster. That's what you do when you're faced with an irresistible force. Bluster decides to mix a ton of different hair tonics together when he realizes his hair is starting to fall out, and this ends up transforming him into Leo Luster, a smooth-talking alter ego that has ridiculous hair. Strangely enough, they show Candy beginning to fall for him, but the transformation is only temporary, and by the end of this episode, Bluster changes back permanently. Baby Kong appears in the episode Eight Fu Young, with Donkey Kong accidentally drinking a Ute serum that belongs to Cranky. He becomes a baby version of himself, so technically this isn't a different character from DK. But I'm bringing this up because in a later episode called Baby Kong Blues, Baby Kong reappears as a separate character from DK, who is being babysat by Candy and Dixie. There's no explanation here, so I'm not going to try and theorize. And it's not stated who the parents are of the baby, but he's basically introduced to drive conflict within this episode, getting kidnapped by K. Rule, who expresses interest in raising Baby Kong as his heir. Eddie the Mean Old Yeti is another recurring character that's considered a Kong since it's basically Donkey Kong with white fur. He first appears in the episode Barrel Barrel, Who's Got the Barrel, where Donkey and Diddy Kong have to head into the White Mountains to retrieve their lost crystal coconut, which is in Eddie's possession. And of course, like everything else in this show, it leads into a song. Say, Eddie, how about a deal? Five for the barrel, it's a bargain. It's a steal. Steal? No, but here's the catch. Give us the barrel and we'll give you a match. Finally, we have Kong Fu from the episode Kong Fu. This Kong is hired by King K. Rule to fight Diddy Kong in a contest called the Annual Donkey Kong Challenge. This whole contest is basically organized to keep Donkey Kong on his toes, and it consists of a mind challenge, heart challenge, and the body challenge. And Kong Fu is actually victorious in the mind and body challenges, but chooses to forfeit the entire Kong test after finding out K. Rule was mocking him behind his back. In my opinion, most of these exclusive Kongs serve as minor plot devices for the television show, maybe excluding Bluster Kong, but I guess Japan found Bluster interesting enough to have a cameo in Super Mario Kun. There's even a whole Donkey Kong gag manga series published by Shogakukan based on the animated series, and I'm still surprised this show had any relevance overseas aside from France, of course. He's bigger, faster, and stronger too. He's the first member of the DK crew. Ah huh. uh, yeah, it's time to introduce everyone to the DK crew. These next few Kongs were newly introduced in Donkey Kong 64, all possessing different abilities that helped to diversify Donkey Kong's first fully 3D game. The story opens with King K. Rule getting ready to begin his next attempt of conquering the DK Isles. And Donkey Kong's friends are all kidnapped, so you play with DK at first to release the other members of the crew one by one before they become playable. So let's go over them in order of the DK rap. First up is Tiny Kong, who is the younger sister of Dixie Kong. 
Instead of a ponytail, Tiny Kong is rocking pigtails which she can use to attack enemies and add a little extra distance to her jumps. In Donkey Kong 64, she's the fastest Kong of the bunch, but as a consequence has the weakest physical abilities in the group. She can learn a skill in game called Mini Monkey from Cranky's Lab, allowing her to shrink in size and gain access to small openings throughout the game. Some of her early concept art is drastically different from her final design, depicting a monkey with a fez and a vest. In fact, this just looks like a totally different character altogether. No! But the game's character designer at Rare, Mark Stevenson, was asked on Twitter why Dixie was excluded in favor of Tiny, and his response was, quote, Long time ago, can't recall exactly. I guess we just love creating new Kongs. I would say it would be because we wanted a character that fitted with the shrinking ability. Tiny Kong would make a few cameos in games after this, like the Game Boy Advance remakes of Donkey Kong Country 2 and 3, and would go on to get a complete redesign with a more teenaged look when she was added as one of the racers in Diddy Kong Racing DS. And while she's a playable character in other spin-off titles like Donkey Kong Barrel Blast and Mario Super Sluggers, this was the last time we'd see Tiny Kong, making it 15 years since her last appearance. Speaking of neglected, meet Lanky Kong. I strongly believe this is a relative of the shunned Manky Kong, because not only do their names rhyme, but they're both orangutans. And as his name suggests, Lanky has the longest reach of the DK crew, allowing him to hit enemies from a further distance with his attacks. On the old Rare website, they mentioned that Lanky joined the DK crew from a distant branch of the family. Lanky's something of a wild card, a gangly, loping orangutan whose long arms work particularly well in the creme bashing department. Funny enough, Cranky describes him in a similar light in the Donkey Kong 64 instruction booklet, saying, A newcomer to the Kong clan and the Joker of the pack. I haven't a clue who he's related to, must be a distant cousin or something. Nintendo. If you truly want to make a new DK game, have all the orangutans rise up in an all-out war against the Kongs. Then make Lanky betray the DK crew at the end, serving as a double agent for Mankey, the main antagonist of your next game. Rare left all the clues behind for you, just do it. Anyway, Lanky is somewhat underutilized, and while there's some concept art of him that shows he would have appeared in the cancelled Donkey Kong Racing game, I think this is another Kong that has fallen to the wayside. Aside from being a playable racer in Donkey Kong Barrel Blast back in 2007, Lanky hasn't made any major appearances since then. Last in the DK crew is Chunky Kong, the burliest of the group. In Donkey Kong 64, he has the ability to lift and toss boulders, but is also the slowest on the team. Chunky is also the brother of Kitty Kong and a cousin to Dixie and Tiny Kong. Much like Kitty, there's not really much to say about Chunky here. He's received even less attention than Lanky and Tiny over the years, only appearing in a cameo for one of the funky challenges in Donkey Kong Country 3, the Game Boy Advance remake. But if it's any consolation, he does appear in the Super Mario Brazas movie, cheering for Donkey Kong in the crowd besides Diddy and Dixie. The new members of the DK crew would technically be the last set of Kongs that were created and designed by Rare. In 2002, Microsoft purchased Rare, which would put an end to their era in regards to Donkey Kong's story. But there was a scrap sequel to Diddy Kong Racing for the Game Boy Advance, known as Diddy Kong Pilot, that Rare was developing prior to their acquisition. It was never officially released, or rather it was repurposed into a game called Banjo Pilot instead. But there is yet another Kong within the prototypes of Diddy Kong Pilot. In a very early build of the game, there's a scrap Kong in the character select lineup wearing a straw hat and some overalls. Thanks to an anonymous ex-Rare employee that released some additional details in 2010, we know this character was going to be named Redneck Kong. Cool. The employee has said, quote, The hillbilly was known as Redneck Kong and was a very short-lived idea from the designer of the project. Sometime during that time, the screenshot was obviously captured. So yeah, this Kong was essentially dead on arrival, but it's cool that it got leaked to the public. The Donkey Kong franchise from that point on went through a bit of an experimental phase with Nintendo creating the rhythm game series Donkey Konga, a puzzle-based spin-off known as the DK series, and the Mario vs. Donkey Kong series, the spiritual successor to Donkey Kong 94. But there is one interesting game that brought some platforming elements back and introduced a new set of Kongs, this time serving as antagonists. Donkey Kong Jungle Beat for the GameCube, which released in 2005. And I shit you not, this is the story from the original instructions booklet. Pound anything that gets in DK's way as he conquers the kingdoms and becomes the king of the jungle lands. 
That's it. So the story may be simple, but I have to mention how Nintendo promoted this game. They sent out around 50 people dressed in gorilla outfits holding DK bongos to run in the Los Angeles Marathon. And Nintendo has gone on to say that the participants of the marathon were encouraging and cheering the gorillas on. Can you imagine you train all year for this marathon and you have a pack of gorillas running beside you? Anyway, props to the people that powered through this event wearing those suits. Donkey Kong Jungle Beat does introduce five new Kongs that serve as the main bosses that aim to impede Donkey Kong's conquest. Dread Kong is the first and is the king of Banana Kingdom. And funny enough, they went with the name Rasta Kong for the European release. The second boss is Karate Kong, King of Pineapple Kingdom. His name in Japan and some European languages is Kong Fu. And whether this is a throwback to our boy over here from the animated series or a coincidence is anyone's guess. He's followed up by Ninja Kong, ruler of Durian Kingdom and the third boss of the game. And though his name is Bushido Kong in Japan, I also find it funny that they went with the name Kong Fu for the Italian translation. People really seem to love that pun. Sumo Kong is the fourth boss of the game and leader of the Starfruit Kingdom, and for some reason they fight on an asteroid in space. Not like Donkey Kong hasn't taken his fight to space before though. Or was this cranky? And DK's final fight in this game is with Ghastly King, or as they call him in Japan, Final Kong. And unfortunately there's no backstory for these Kongs, which is a little disappointing as I find their designs pretty interesting. There was a Wii re-release for this game that added more of an expanded story into the manuals, saying that all of this started when the peace of the jungle was disrupted by a rampaging pack of wild baddies. So in this expanded story, these bosses suddenly appear and just laid claim to all of these kingdoms, which kind of changes the original interpretation of Donkey Kong just challenging the leaders of these kingdoms to become king of the jungle. Personally, I prefer the narrative of Donkey Kong just waking up and wanting all the smoke that day. So this game ends with Donkey Kong pummeling the crap out of Final Kong and all the leaders of the kingdom concede defeat, as DK becomes the official king of the jungle. I thought King Kong was king of the jungle. <laughs> You know what I forgot in the original video? The Cyber Kongs from Donkey Kong Barrel Blast. How could I forget these Cyber Kongs? They're only on the Cosmic Highway racetrack, so they're very forgettable, but here's a little video of them just in case you didn't know they existed. All right, moving on. So that's more or less every Kong from the DK series, but there's some honorable mentions that make an appearance outside of the traditional Donkey Kong games. Super Mario RPG for the Super Nintendo has these enemies called Gorillas, as in Gorilla Warfare, that can be encountered in the forest maze, and they heavily resemble Donkey Kong himself. Their Japanese name is also pretty interesting, Dosoki Yungu, which when you say it out loud doesn't make much sense, but there's a clever pun on the spelling of the name as they swapped out two katakana characters from the spelling of Donkey Kongu and replace them with similar looking characters which gives you Dosoki Yungu instead. Now in battle, when you use Malo's special technique Psychopath, this allows the players to read the enemy's mind. And in the case of Gorilla, he says, quote, don't confuse me with someone else. This Kong is Bink, a living Kong skeleton. He's a crew member of the SS Chocola in Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga for the Game Boy Advance. The SS Chocola is explored by the Mario Brothers within the events of the game, but plot twist, they discover that the ship sank a very long time ago. All the sailors on board are now undead skeletons. Bink hosts a barrel minigame which must be completed by the brothers to obtain a membership card to get further into the ship. And I guess since it involves barrels, having a Kong skeleton be the host was a nice little joke established by the dev team. The name Bink is pronounced Binky in Japan, which makes the correlation between him and Donkey a little bit more clear. Unfortunately, in the 3DS remake, the model was completely changed to match the other crewmates. Kind of an odd choice, not really sure why they'd choose to do this. Now in the Mario vs Donkey Kong series, several robot Kongs are introduced as enemies, and I guess it's assumed that DK is creating these robots to stop Mario in these games, majority of them being in Mario vs Donkey Kong 2, March of the Minis. I guess DK is a little smarter than we give him credit for. Rabbit Kong! Is this thing a Kong or a rabbit? Or both? Well this guy was introduced as an enemy in Mario and Rabbit's Kingdom Battle for the Nintendo Switch, and becomes the main antagonist for the Donkey Kong Adventure expansion that released later on. Rabbit Kong is defeated in the main story in a comical way by Mario and his friends. So after this defeat, Rabbit Kong wants revenge, and the DK expansion follows Donkey Kong, Rabbit Peach, and Rabbit Cranky who work together to defeat Rabbit Kong. He gets quite the glow up here at some point in this story, upgrading to Mega Rabbit Kong, a corrupted version of himself that serves as the final boss of the expansion. I really gotta get around to finishing this game and the sequel. Finally, Ookie Kongs. Aww. 
And I was debating whether or not to leave this part in, but this is a cool piece of trivia, so let's show them some love. Uki Kongs are enemies from Yoshi's Crafted World for the Nintendo Switch, and they're beefier versions of Ukikis, hence Uki Kongs. But the history of this enemy goes all the way back to 1994. Apparently, a similar version of the Ukikis was planned for the original Yoshi's Island game, but remained unused. This enemy was internally named Boss Monkey, complete with a barrel throwing animation and a tie. Look familiar? It's a shame this one went unused, but shout out to the cutting room floor for digging this one up. Now, with the Kongs introduced as citizens of the Jungle Kingdom in the Super Mario Bros. movie, I see a lot of potential for some of the Kongs I named in this video to make a reappearance. Now, this is still speculation for rumors at this point, but it's said that a Donkey Kong spin-off movie was being planned by Nintendo and Illumination, and if that's the case, Kongs that never truly got time in the spotlight like Candy, Chunky, Tiny, and Lanky can be reintroduced with a fresh coat of paint. This also leaves the floor open to brand new Kongs as well, as we see tons of generic Kongs in the audience during Mario and Donkey Kong's fight scene in the movie. So whatever is next for this franchise, I'd be more than happy to make an update video to cover future revelations. Look at you, you made it to the end. You get a banana. There you go. I might just be talking to a sleeping person. Well, I want to thank you for watching the entire compilation. Who knows what's next for DK at this point? Like, we do have the Mario vs. Donkey Kong game coming out for the Switch, but I'm hoping that we get something more substantial in the near future. Thank you for enjoying the content, and I want you to leave Donkey Kong Stole My Banana in the comments below if you got this far. First person to do it will probably get pinned in the comments section below. Until our next compilation, it's been real. The Prophet. I spoke it. Peace.